There was no ceremony, no fanfare, no formal announcement. But nevertheless, the life of a Bahamian prophet had begun. They named him Alvin, Simon, Mark. God had given a prophet for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Alvin was the last child of 11 children, five sons and six daughters. As he neared the age of four, he went to live with his sister Daisy and her husband. And when his mother died five years later, he remained with Daisy in her home in True Blue, Crooked Island. He was a good student in the True Blue School. And as was the custom in those days, at 16 years old, he completed school. And with the consent of his guardian, undertook to seek his own livelihood as a man. From a place called Fortune Island, he boarded a Hamburg American steamer bound for Central America. The first stop, Cuba, then Kingston, Jamaica, and then on to the Panama Canal Zone. In this strange country, this young man worked as a clerk in an office for a number of months, while others worked jobs such as stevedores, and construction. But soon much of the work concluded as the Panama Canal was completed and as World War I broke out. Alvin returned to the Bahamas for a few months. But soon there was a restlessness in his spirit and a burning ambition to travel again. So soon he took a steamer to North America, entering at the port of Miami, and began working there, returning only periodically to Crooked Island. Little did he know that the events in his life were following a divine pattern, a divine plan, that blueprint constructed by God the master architect. And so in April of 1920, while in Florida, a transformation in his life took place. He received the Lord Jesus Christ into his life and became a Christian. He was baptized in water. He returned home in early 1921, and there he met a man named Stanley R. Ferguson a Cabbage Hill preacher who had also just returned to Crooked Island, having also recently been saved in 1919 in Princeton, Florida. Soon after, and in April of 1921, Alvin S. Moss was sanctified and baptized with the Holy Ghost. The very hand of God was swiftly fashioning this man for a great work. The 17th of May, 1921, was a wonderful day. For on this day, Alvin S. Moss was married to Eliza Louise, daughter of Zedekiah and Roselda Moss of True Blue. To this union, God later added three daughters, Evelyn, now deceased, Dorinda Daisy, and Roberta Eliza, and one son, Arthur Cyril. Ever since he became a Christian, Alvin S. Moss began to feel that God had ordained him for some special purpose. But he needed some proof, some sign, 
That sign came in 1921, and in his own words, in his own handwriting, Alvin S. Moss wrote that in his entire lifetime, he had told this vision only a few times and to only a few persons. This vision was the manner God chose to commission him as his servant. Seven years ago, Alvin S. Moss told me the story of this vision. One day, in the early dawning hours of the morning, he was taken away in a trance. He saw a man coming toward him. The man was 25 feet tall, and he was very wide. He seemed to be clothed with the clouds. He came right up to Brother Moss's bed where he stretched out his two large arms over him, slowly and quietly repeating the words, ordained a minister of God. And then immediately after the third time, a, the sound of a, an enormous and stunning, deafening downpour of rain followed. Whereupon Brother Moss got up with a start and still hearing this downpour, went to the door to view the tempest and to see how high the water had already risen. But lo and behold, as he looked outside, the morning sun was just peeping through the clouds, and it shone beautifully. There wasn't one drop of rain. Brother Moss could feel the sacredness and the nearness of God. Now he was ready for the great task that was to come. From here on, he started to preach. But his ministry was so different that the orthodox denominations could not abide him. For this man and his followers preached in a manner and under some supernatural power that people felt themselves under a divine influence and sometimes began to speak in tongues and shout hallelujah. So soon Alvin and his partner Stanley had to take his ministry to the streets. Early in 1922, a church, the Church of God, was set in order by Alvin S. Moss, assisted by foreign evangelists, in the home of Brother Felix Benneby, the father of Bishop Nathaniel Benneby, at Brown, Crooked Island, with 27 members. Alvin S. Moss was made the pastor. Indeed, a very few members of that first congregation of 1922 are alive and are able to see and hear me today. We have from the establishment of this church, the start of the era of the so-called Pentecostal churches in the Bahamas. Economic times were good in Florida and many Bahamian men were leaving to go there. Alvin S. Moss also prepared to go to live in Florida. But almost as he was ready to go, he had a serious fall from a horse and was seriously injured. While he was recovering, God spoke to him and told him to build a church, a house of God. And he did so, and he built a church at a place called Big Sand, between True Blue and Brown, Crooked Island. Alvin S. Moss pastored this congregation for almost 10 years. In 1924, in the first colonial convention, he was made a licensed minister 
and district overseer of Meguana, Inagua, Crooked Island, Acklands, and Long Key. In addition, he conducted many revivals, evangelizing these and other islands. In 1931, he came to Nassau to pastor the church at Freetown. This he did for three years while supervising the building of the main church in Taylor Street, off East Street, as the building contractor. And then in 1934, he was appointed overseer of Inagua and pastor of the church there. But he never got to take up that pastorship. The existing colonial overseer of the Bahamas, Stanley Reuben Ferguson, took ill and died on July 23, 1934, leaving Alvin S. Moss in charge of the work. It was a difficult time. A big group of members had recently strayed to form their own church. A strong leader was needed. God gave Alvin S. Moss a vision of how to be a leader who could bring respect to these spirit-motivated worshipers. It seemed that hard times were on every side. Even Brother Stanley's funeral had cost 20 pounds, and there was but three pounds in the church treasury. But Alvin S. Moss rose to the challenge. After preaching the sermon at Brother Stanley's funeral, Alvin S. Moss wrote as follows. We held Brother Stanley's funeral in the unfinished Taylor Street Church under the hot sun, he wrote. Then we lay our trembling hands on the work and move forward in the name of Jesus. And move forward, he did. Undoubtedly strengthened when he recalled that another leader named Moses had found himself in similarly difficult circumstances. And God had spoken to him and told him to speak to the children of Israel and tell them to move forward. Part one, the first almost 40 years being completed. Alvin S. Moss moved into part two, the second and most dynamic portion of his life's ministry. Having been appointed overseer of the Bahamas in 1934, he then embarked upon a 48 year journey which led him into September of 1982. He was as great as the dreams he dreamed, as great as the love he showed, as great as the values he taught and the happiness he shared. He was as great as the thoughts he pondered and the worth he attained, as great as the fountain at which his spirit drank and the insights he had gained. He was as great as the truth he spoke, as great as the help he gave, as great as the destiny he sought, as great as the life he lived. He was a great patriarch, a prophet of God in the church of God. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory.